Hey y'all, welcome to Free Life Chapel, where we help you discover and live the free life in Christ. My name is Anna, and we are so excited that you decided to tune in today. Feel free to check out our website, freelifechapel.org, to find out more about who we are, what we do, and how you can become a part of it. If you ever find yourself in the Central Florida area, please come visit us. Free Life Chapel would love to connect with you. Until then, please enjoy our amazing message we have in store for you. Check it out. Everybody say energy. Everybody say energy. Energy, energy. I want to talk to you today about this energy of life. Now, in my, in my life, I've been called an energizer bunny. I don't take it like the wrong way, but I'm also kind of mad. Like, why can't I be like the energizer giraffe? Like, I'm six foot seven. Like, why you put me in a bunny? Like, I'm tall, but like, some of y'all get that at lunch. Um, but I've, I've been called an energizer bunny because I'm always just go, 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 go. Like, I need to learn how to turn myself down a little bit. Anybody else that way? You, you're that, you're that go. Cody, thank you for raising your hand. You're that, you're that go, Cody. You're that go, Cody. Okay, yeah. I, I, I just naturally have this energy that I have. I, I don't know why, even with two kids, <laughs> have this energy. Have you ever used the phrase to somebody, yo, I like your energy. I like your vibe. Maybe whenever you went on a date with that person. And you're still trying to get the feel for who they are and kind of what they do. And at the end of the day, like, you, you took them, like, to McDonald's to the dollar menu. And you was like, okay, well, they ain't got a dollar menu no more, but the 250 menu. And you, you was there, you was talking to them. And, and you're like, you know what? I like your energy. I'm going to actually take you out to Brits after this one. We're we, we going to see what happens. Or maybe, maybe you just started a new job. You're trying to figure out who are your people going to be at work. That's a big question. So who is going to be my people? Who do I vibe with? Who do I not? And so while everybody's getting some water, getting coffee, or doing something, you, you're just hanging around there and you're observing to see which vibe do I like the most? Which energy do I connect with the most? The reality is you and I, we judge people based off of the vibe and the energy that they give, don't we? Yeah, we do. And people judge you based off of the vibe and the energy that you give. It, it, it's what it is. The Bible says that God looks at the heart, but man looks on the outside. So we, we look at the energy that people give out. Are you a happy person? Are you a pessimist? Are you optimistic? Are you glass half full, glass half empty? And we all gravitate towards different energies. So not calling one better or worse, but we all have certain energies that we love to go towards. When I'm sad, I don't want to be around sad energy. I need to be around something happy. When you've ever been, if you've ever been sick, the last thing you want to do is hang out with, with somebody else that is sick because now both of y'all depressed about being sick. Now, I need to get out. Like, let's go do something. I mean, like, don't spread your germs. But, like, get out of it. Like, make me feel better. Let me go. If, if I get in a funk or if I get in a rut, when, I, when there's been times where I haven't been in the gym, I don't want to go hang out with people then who aren't in the gym because I know I want to be in the gym. I need to get with some people who like, Bro, you're getting lazy. You look terrible. Get yourself back in the gym, bro. Let's go and start moving. I want people to help build up my energy and not retract it. Energy matters. And what are we really saying when we say to somebody, I like your energy? We're saying, I like your attitude. I like your perspective. I, I like the way that you live your life. I, I like what you add to this world. I, I, I like how I feel whenever I'm around you or the feeling I get once you leave the room. It's noticeable. That person isn't here anymore. That person isn't in the break room. That person isn't in the house. Uh, that person isn't in the classroom. They're not on the team anymore. It's noticeable when that gets removed. Well, the Bible is all about giving us better energy in our life. The Bible is all about giving us better energy. Because the Bible wants you to be a better version of you. How many of you would say that there's a better version of me that I can be? Me too. The, the sad thing for me is I want this, oh my God, spiritual encounter to just happen and make it, and make it work. And it ain't never done that to me before. I ain't going to limit God and say that it won't, but it has never happened to me that way. It's been, it takes work. It takes a process. Uh, Paul, he, he says, I don't say this as if I've already accomplished it. It's just something I'm in process of. That's how I feel. This idea of the Bible helping us have better energy isn't something that I've accomplished. It's just something I'm in the middle of process of, just like you are right now. 
The Bible talks about how Christians should be attractive. We should have an attractive energy. We should have an attractive vibe as a Christ follower. That's exactly why the Matthew chapter 5 verse 13 says this, you are the salt of the earth. As a Christ follower, you are the thing that makes chicken taste good. You are the thing that makes Thanksgiving so appealing every single year. Like, it's because of you as a Christ follower. If I could put it this way, as a Christian, you are the adobo, the sazon, the complete seasoning, the whatever seasoning you want to. You are that in the world. But now what makes you and I that in the world? It's because we're Christians. And because Christian means Christ follower, for me to be a Christ follower, I have to know what he says. I have to know where, where am I following, which is where this book comes into play. There's a lot of books that I've held in my life. A few. A couple that I've read. <laughs> Joking. A lot of books I've held in my life, several that I've read, none have had this impact. None. You ever have something, like maybe it's that one movie or that one song, that no matter what season of life you're in, when that song plays or when that movie hits, it like makes everything all good all over again or it takes you to a whole other level? Yeah, that's what the Bible does but on steroids. It comes to benefit and enhance your life like nothing else possible. It is your person. You know that person you go to when you cry, that person you go to when you celebrate? That's what this Bible is. God said, I gave you this book because I want to be your person. And when I'm your person and we're relating and we're doing things together and you're using my word as your GPS, your God's positioning system in your life in order to know how to navigate down these streets of Polk County as you're using this, then you are like the salt of the earth. That is what makes you and I attractive. It's not because the braces your mom and daddy got you when you was in eighth grade. It's not just because that fresh cut you just got or the $5,000 worth of ink we put on our bodies. I ain't put $5,000. I ain't got $5,000. But it ain't because of the ink. It ain't because the braces. It ain't because the hair. It ain't because the shoes. It ain't because of none of that. It has everything to do with me having the Bible on the inside of me. Because the Bible cares about who I am more than it cares about what I do. It cares about who I am more than what I do. I remember growing up, um, I don't know if y'all know this about me, I'm gonna tell it myself for a second, but just keep it in the room, all right? Let this family talk. I talk a lot. I don't know if y'all knew that. It's surprising, I know. I know. I talk a lot. And um, I used to get in trouble for talking back. A lot. That's why my face kind of slid sideways. Pastor Cindy's hand was serious. I talk back a lot. And I remember when when they used to say, when my mom used to say, like, she she would talk to me. She would scold me. And then she would say, just wait for your daddy to get home. It's bedtime. My bad, mom. I try to get in bed real early. Dad would pull me out of bed. Yeah, they, they never said, wait for your daddy to get home. And my dad did not get me once he got home. And so I, I remember there was one time particular, whoo particular, uh, he, he got me out of bed and we were talking. And he didn't talk anything to me about what I said to my mom. He didn't talk anything to me about the tone that I used. He, he didn't say any of that. He said, what makes you think that you can talk that way to authority no matter who they are in your life? He went to a deeper problem. Because the reality is, I could have not talked back to her verbally, but my attitude and my motive could have been even more damaging. So he said, I I want to get rid of the cancer that's on the inside that's not seen, but we're just seeing effects of it. Let's remove that. That's what the Bible does in your life and in my life. It removes those things that we don't even know what the root of the problem is, but the Bible is like, I start to read it and it reads me. And it freaks me out. Like, all right, God, you just snapped and that verse just showed up because I ain't never seen that before in my life. Pastor Scott ain't never preached a message on that verse before. I ain't never had that one used on me. Like, come on now. That's what the Bible does. It reads us, it betters us, it enhances us. But I have to make sure that I'm in it. See, this book, 
This book is different. It's, it's 66 accumulated books with, with over 30 writers, but don't mistake, it only has one author. The Bible says that all word, all of the word of God is inspired by God. This isn't an accumulation of somebody's MySpace, Facebook, Twitter, and X in threads, if you want to throw that in there. The statuses that they just started writing in and throwing in. No, this, this is the word of God given in order to help you and to help me in life. We are changed once we get this Bible on the inside of us. You ever heard the phrase, you are what you eat? Boy, I used to eat so much chicken growing up. My mom used to say, you eat another chicken, you're going to turn it to a chicken. We used to hear that all the time. And I, 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 love, I love the phrase, you are what you eat. Like it, it was funny and it was cute until it no longer pertained to food. The Bible says that there's three gates to our soul. Our eye gate, our ear gate, and our mouth gate. And I am constantly feeding myself with what I see, what I hear, and what I say. What are you eating? And what is getting into your soul? What are you eating? Are, are you eating the word of God and so it's making my life better and it's helping to take me to another level? And no, I don't like my circumstances. And no, I'm not a fruit loop. I understand that this right now is not fun. I'm, I can be a realist. I don't have to be weird. I'm a realist. I don't like what I'm going through. But I can also be a person of faith saying, I'm not staying here either. I will get through this thing. I, I know what it is to get a doctor's report from a family member that I cannot stand. It doesn't make any logical sense. There's no way that this could have happened to this person. It's funny. I start to morally justify why God should do things. That's not the Bible. Uh, but I start doing all these different things as to why this shouldn't happen, why this shouldn't happen. But the reality is, it's here. We need to face it head on. How can I walk through this thing? That's what the Bible wants to deal with. It doesn't want to just deal with the good times and celebratory times. No, we have a lot of people who celebrate with us, very few who cry with us. A lot of people who might post about you, but several people who will follow up with you. The Bible says, I want to be here for you from the mountaintops to the valleys in all times. I want to be right here with you, but you got to get it in me in order for me to do something with you. What are you eating? Because you are what you eat. I used to do bodybuilding. I still do. I just do it different. It used to be with weights. Now I do it with Oreos. Uh, <laughs> we used to do bodybuilding, and, and in bodybuilding, my coach, he, he used to tell me, he said, Caleb, I'm giving you this diet plan, but here's the thing. I'm... I don't care if you like what the food tastes like. <laughs> that doesn't matter to me. Because food is not a pleasure at this moment in time. Food is your energy source. That's it. The reason why you're eating is so you can do a desired outcome. That's it. It changed my mind on how I viewed food. I'm using it as energy. Every single thing you and I eat spiritually, with our soul, with our mind, our ears, whether it's, uh, whether it's in a relationship, whether it's on social media, whether it's on a TV, whether it's in a song, it is feeding us. And there's going to be an outcome that comes from it. And I will either be really, really happy or really, really disappointed with the outcome, but I'm the one that picks the quality of food that I'm eating. What, is, what are you eating? Are you eating, are you eating bitterness? Have you ate some anger recently and so now you walk around with a chip on your shoulder looking for somebody who looks at you the wrong way just so you could check them? Have you ate unforgiveness? And so now every time you go through life, it just seems like all these people are leaving your life, leaving your life, leaving your life when the reality is I'm pushing them away because don't nobody want to be around somebody who doesn't give grace and give mercy? Have I been eating jealousy where I know I've lost my ability to celebrate and encourage people because I'm too envious and I'm too bitter that what you have, I want that for my life. And now I'm comparing in life. So life is now a competition. It's not an enjoyment. It's not an opportunity. It's something that is heavy and it's a burden. What, what have we eaten? We, we need to get this in check. The, the Jewish people, they, they dealt with this in Exodus chapter 16 
talked about the story of uh, when, when Moses brought the people out of Egypt through the exile. They're wandering in the wilderness, and, and while they were there, they were kept talking, man, we need food, man, we need food. Moses went and prayed to God, God, I really need you to, su- to supply some food. So God said, all right, here's what I'm going to do. Every day I'm going to rain down red lobster biscuits, and I need you to get everybody to go, and they need to gather up enough biscuits for the day. Not for the week, for the day. If they get more than what they need for the day, it will go bad. It'll, it'll vanish. It'll disappear. So I need them to get what they need for the day, and then the next day, I'm going to make it rain. Then the next day, I'm going to make it rain. Next day, wouldn't it be great if the world was raining the biscuits from Red Lobster? Like, he said, I, I'm, I'm going to make this whole thing happen. I'm going to make this whole thing happen. So every single day, the people that had to go out, gather their food, and then come back in. And then every night, I guarantee you, because they're human just like you and me, they're probably thinking, I wonder if there's going to be enough tomorrow. Is this supply still going to be here? Or did he accidentally do something right? What, what, what do I have to do? What do I have to do? People, they, they found out real quick that I have to go back to the source of where I get this energy from. See, that's why I can't just do church once a week. I love being here on Sundays. And there is nothing that replaces being in a community of people that worship the presence of God together because I don't always feel like doing it. But when I look over and I see other people lifting their hands and clapping and taking notes and amening and getting a revelation from God, then it makes me want to do that as well. So the atmosphere 100% matters. But I eat more than three times a day, but I expect to be spiritually fed once a week. I try that. Malnourished. Malnourished. Bad nutrition. Bad. And now I'm wondering why I have all these pains in my life. I'm in my stomach. I'm wondering why I have all these headaches that I'm dealing with. Because I haven't fed myself properly in order for me to do the things that I know that I need to do. The Bible's here to make us stronger. That's the whole purpose of it. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, it says this. And when you see the highlighted parts, I need you to read it out loud and loudly with me. It says this, the whole Bible. Pause. Not the Old Testament, not just the New Testament. The entire Bible, the whole Bible was given to us by inspired from God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It straightens us out and it helps us do what is right. It is God's way of making us well prepared at every point, fully equipped to do good to everyone. The Bible makes me prepared for life. The Bible helps me have that good energy, produce those good vibes, to be able to live the best life possible with myself and with all those that are around me. God is all about enhancing our life. But are we going to eat it? Are we going to digest it? Are we going to do something with it? The Bible works when I work it. But if I just set it on the table and it's a good decoration piece, if I just leave it as a, as a coaster so I make sure that my wood table don't get messed up, then it won't work with the way that it could. All the power was there, it just never got unlocked. You and I need to unlock what this thing says. It, again, it's all about enhancing our lives. In Matthew chapter 5, uh, Jesus was just starting his ministry, uh, and, and he, he started performing some miracles and started gaining some influence with people, and, and he went and he, he started walking up towards this mountain, and thousands of people began to follow him. In my Bible, maybe yours does too, it calls this in Matthew chapter 5, the Sermon on the Mount, right? The very popular sermon that Jesus gave where he talked about a bunch of different things all in this one topic, but But notice this, in my ESV version of the Bible, the Sermon on the Mount has 110 verses. But the first 12 deal with our attitude. It says, if you're going to take in what I'm about to give you, I need these things set up first. I, I need you to make sure that this gets in you first 
so that we can keep going on to, to, to some other things. Jesus, Jesus was talking about who he wants us to be right off rip. Talking about the energy that I need you to bring is this kind of energy. Now, once you get this kind of energy, you're going to see how all this other stuff I'm going to talk about is going to make sense. In Matthew 5, it, it, it talks about eight different beatitudes is what they were called. And I'll paraphrase them by saying them this way. He said, number one, I need you to be submissive towards God. I need you to understand your limitations and his power. I need you to understand your humanity and his divinity. I need you to understand who you, your job description versus his. Like, he's him, I'm me. Which is great, I like to think. But still, like, I, 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 I'm made in his image. He's not made in my image. Like, there is a difference. He is the epitome of what things are. I need to be submissive towards God. Do what he says so I can get his results. That's that being submissive. I need to obey. I need to be empathetic. I need to have empathy towards people. I need to have empathy whenever I see injustice. I need to have empathy when I see bullying. I need to have empathy whenever I see wrong being done to people. I need to have empathy. I cannot lose my humanity. A, a kinship to brothers and sisters and, and to people. I need to be humble was the third thing he said. Put your pride aside and be humble. I need to be, number four, in pursuit of God's standards. Be in pursuit of righteousness, God's standards, his way of living, his way of doing things. Number five, I need to be compassionate towards people. Don't you love someone who's compassionate? Isn't that appealing? Doesn't that just make you want to be around them more? Because they're not just pointing fingers at judge. No, they have compassion. They feel what you're feeling. God said, I want you to produce that kind of energy. I want you to be pure in heart and in motive. What he says, and he said, I want you to be a peacemaker. You know that's hard? That's not easy. It's easier to be divisive than to be a peacemaker. When I'm a peacemaker, it says it means that I can say something, but I won't say it. I could do something, but I won't do it because I'm working to hold the peace. And then it says, I need you to be courageous with your faith. Don't rep your favorite college football team more than you rep the name of Jesus Christ. Don't rep your high school letterman jacket more than you rep the fact that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. He said, I need you to be courageous with who I am. Not weird, but be courageous. Talk about it. Show it. Let it live out in your lifestyle. These eight things that he talked about are all things that help to better us in our life. But there's so many more that go throughout this Bible. And I'm just saying, I would love for Liz to get these eight things down. Man, if my wife Liz got these eight things down, life would be great. And I can say it because she's not here right now. I love you, baby. Uh, my life would be great if she got it. And her life would be better if I got these eight things down. And this is eight. Those are 12 verses out of all of this. God is about upgrading your life. There's an objective to this book to get you better in life, to take you from where you are to where Jesus died for you to be, from where we are to where God created us to be. There is a gap from where we are to where God intended. And this book is the ladder that we climb in order to get everything that God died for us to have. But we got to work it. We got to work in it. So I want to talk real quick, give three quick points on what are some things that we do in order to get this energy, that, that, that this good vibes, that's attractive to people. And what do I do that, to get this to be the salt of the earth? But then also, and what's sometimes harder, what do I have to do in order to sustain it or keep it? I know what it is to be really excited at first, and I'm good. I don't need no motivation. Mm, determination over motivation. Mm, get it. Yeah, and then two weeks, three weeks slip in, and it's like, oh, shoot. Well, I'm tired. Is it really, does it take all that? And I start trying to pick and choose. Like, it don't take all that. Like, but I was already at church today, bro. Like, I don't need the day of the verse on Monday. I'm good. You know what I'm saying? Like, and I start picking and choosing, and then I undo a thread that I can't put back together. So what are the things that I can do in order to get this energy, but then also sustain it for a long period of time? The first thing is this. You and I, we need to understand how much God loves us. Do you know how much God actually loves you? 
Yeah, I hear people talk about it. No, I'm not asking, have you heard people talk about it? Have you experienced how much God actually loves you? The love that gives you a grace and a mercy from whenever you did something stupid. I'm just talking about for me. The love that keeps you from having certain consequences that the way my life was going, I should, that should be my outcome. But it's not. How? Had nothing to do with me. A God that loves me so much to, to, to put people and to put a community around me to help encourage me, to help my kids. I couldn't ask for that. I don't know how to articulate that. God says, I love you so much to give you what you need, not just what you ask for. That's how much I love you. Billy Graham, doctor, put some respect on his name. Dr. Billy Graham says this, that the Bible is a love letter from God to us. All these 66 books is different ways and different descriptions and explanations of how in love with you God is. It's the whole purpose of this thing. In John chapter 5, verse 39, the Bible actually says this, you search the scriptures because you think they give you eternal life, but the scriptures point to me. So you think they give you eternal life, and, and, and they do. They talk, about, they talk about what eternal life is. They talk about how to get eternal life. But the Bible also says that Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one gets to the Father except through me. So you want to figure out how to have this eternal life? You have to understand my love for you first. Because it's my love that is the only reason why you're able to have that eternal life. Not because you're 401K. Not because of how many social media followers you have. Not because of how you're trending on TikTok. And not because you know how to finesse your words and network. No, it is only because the love that Jesus Christ and God have for you and for me that we even have claim to this thing called eternal life. John 3, 16 talks about his sacrificial love. Romans 5, verse 20 talks about his limitless grace. And Jeremiah 29, 11 talks about his prosperous inheritance that he's already set aside for you and for me. That only happens to people that he loves. He says, I love you. I want to be in relationship with you. I just need you to want to be in relationship with me too. If you love me, please say so. I got JoJo running in the back of my mind. If you love me, please say so. Like, let me know what's going on because I want to do this thing, but I need your participation back. But once I understand how much God loves me, then it leads me to the second thing where I'm able to start removing limitations from my life. Again, this Bible, it tells me how much God loves me, and then this Bible helps to remove the limitations off of my life. How does it do that? Because the people who are able to correct me, to teach me the most, are the people that I love the most. Because I'll let you get to those insecure parts of my life. I'll let you say things to me that I don't let nobody else talk to me that way, talk about that subject, poke and prod and push like I told you I was done. And you said, I know you're done, but you need to hear this, so keep going. Like, that better come from somebody that I love because there's a trust factor that comes into that relationship. Once I know and I understand how much God loves me, now I trust him enough in order to help remove the limitations off of my life. And you know what our biggest limitation is? Ourselves. You are your biggest limitation in life. I am my biggest limitation in life. When I get out of the way, God can bless me how he's always intended. I'm the one that is stopping blessing, stopping advance, stopping opportunity. It is my fault. It's my sin nature. God came to change our nature. Say, I want to be able to give you even more. Hosea chapter 4 talks about how my people die because of a lack of knowledge. My people die because of an ignorance problem. I don't want to be ignorant in one of two ways. I either don't know any better or I know better, but I'm not willing to learn better. He says, don't let that be the case. Learn how to remove the limitations. That's what this book does. It shows me my blind spots. It shows me the things that I need to grow in. In order to remove limitations, Jesus died to give us a no limits kind of a life. But I got to remove limitations by using the Bible. 
What's limiting us? Attitude, pride, anger, unforgiveness, comparison, jealousy, lack of caring. What is it? Just remove it. Oh, I, I, I would actually, I would advance my life and, and I would get into the Bible more, but, you know, I have a limitation of I'm not able to understand the Bible a lot. Listen, I feel that. Me and King James don't get along. We be throwing body shots at each other. I be dropping elbows on awesome things. So get this, find a translation that you get, but get the word of God in you. That's what I love that whenever I took Activate 2020 to 2021, there was a gentleman that was in the class that was talking about how he had a hard time, under, he had a hard time reading and a hard time understanding the Bible. But he went ahead and he took Activate anyway. And knowing that it was an insecurity, knowing that it was a limitation that had been validated academically with what he was willing to do, he said, I'm going to put aside that limitation. I'm willing to work through that limitation and let me see what comes out on this backside. My man bawled out through the Activate class and has seen tremendous growth. Why? Because he put himself in a position to remove the limitations. It doesn't mean that it wasn't there. It didn't mean that he wasn't struggling, but he just kept fighting. This is how I fight my battles. I put this word inside of me and I allow it to start pushing back on those things that are coming to hinder down my life. Romans chapter 12 verse 2, the Bible says this, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good, pleasing, and perfect. Here's what this means. You've been a Christ follower for some time? Cool. My prayer for you is that you understand that the struggle that you dealt with yesterday is not your struggle that you're dealing with today. Because as long as I'm pursuing God, I am advancing. I should outgrow certain things. It doesn't mean that I need to go back in and test myself. No, 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 no. I ain't being stupid with it. But I'm outgrowing certain things. I should keep walking. If you just are you're shopping this thing of Christianity, once you buy into this life, as we continue pursue, as we pursue, as we pursue, I start getting closer to him and further away from limitations. Closer to him and further away from the things that kept holding me back. Closer to him and further away from my past. That's what happens when I use the Bible to learn how to remove my limitations. And then the last thing is this. We need to train to be more like Jesus. You realize that the term Christian means Christ follower, Christ-like. If I am following Christ and I am trying to be like him, my attitude, my love for people, my acceptance of people, I, I wanna hear people the way that Jesus listened to people. I wanna see people in the value of people and the uniqueness and the diversity the way that Jesus saw the diversity, uniqueness, and beauty of people. I, I want to do that. But in my own body and in my own mind, that does not happen. Because I think I'm right. I think my way is the best way. Do you think that too sometimes? Yeah. So we got to train to be more like Jesus. And that's what the Bible is all about. The Apostle Paul, he equates Christianity a lot with the Olympics and with sports. When I think of this idea of train, if it, when, when, I was, when I was bodybuilding or when I was lifting or playing football, and if my coach was telling me, hey, Caleb, I need you to come out to the field, we're gonna train, I automatically knew I'm sweating, I'm gonna be, in a, I'm gonna be uncomfortable for a little bit, I'm gonna be out of breath, I'm gonna get a little nasty, and I'm not probably gonna be smiling while this is going on. But I know it's gonna make me better. It's for a specific desired outcome. I need to train to be like Jesus. Why? So I can be the salt of the earth. 
so I can produce that good energy that I know is attractive to people, not to show them how great I am or to build my influence or to build my social media. I don't care nothing about that. My goal in life, not perfect, but my goal in life is to be a walking mirror that whenever you look at me and if it's good, you're able to say, dang, look at Caleb, you're doing that. Oh, that's a Jesus thing. He done got that from Jesus. That's all that Jesus juice. And if I mess up, nope, that was 100% Caleb's stupidity. That was me. That was on me. But I do something right again, hey, there goes that Jesus thing. It's a mirror deflecting right back up to him. That's what training to be like Jesus does for us. And then whenever we're done, and I think of it again like the Olympic Games, we're done. It comes to the podium ceremony, and Jesus, we, we meet God face to face, and I can say, God, I trained, I did everything I possibly could. I read my Bible, I, 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 I tried to apply this to my life. I, I didn't just read it as words in order to mark a box, but, but I read it and I tried to see how can I apply this to my life right now. I allowed it to change me. I wasn't so prideful that I pushed back on what the Bible said, but I embraced it. What can I learn? What can I gain from this? And God says, well done, my good and faithful servant. You, you did it. You didn't quit. You weren't perfect, but you did not quit. Romans chapter 8, verse 29 says this. For from the very beginning, God decided that those who came to him, and all along he knew who would, should become like his son, so that his son would be first with many brothers. God's whole objective is for you and I to be Christ-like. Everybody stand to your feet. This Bible, this book, is not just something nice and cute. It's something that has power. It's something that the, the Bible says that it's sharper than a two-edged sword that will pierce against bone and marrow. This Bible is serious. And it's also a love letter that lets you know how valued you are. That you don't have to find value in other people and other things because God has already placed a value on it that no other person would be able to purchase. And, and, and the plan that he has for you is so big that you and I have to remove the limitations off of us because our limitations won't allow us to do the things that God intends for you to do, to make the impact that God intends for you to make an impact in your family, at home, at school, in a classroom, on a ball field, on a court, in any level of life. We have to remove these limitations and training to be like Jesus is the ultimate aspect of that. That's the three objectives of the Bible. Show us the love of God. Teach us to remove limitations and train to be like Jesus. Pastor Scott has this phrase that he uses. He said, the Bible is ancient truths for modern day problems. The OG is trying to put you on game and let you know how to live this life. I'm either going to listen to somebody who's been there, done it, I'm going to push back and I'm going to say, nah, I got to learn things the hard way. No, you don't. No, I don't. When people die for a lack of knowledge, for ignorance problem. I don't want to be ignorant. I want to get this thing in me so that I'm not the reason why my kids are having to learn a lesson that I should have taught them. I don't want to be the reason why my wife is having to learn something 30 years down the road that we couldn't have learned this week because I didn't just apply this. We need to start applying this to our lives. And when we do, when we do, when we do, amazing things happen. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 8, closing with this, says this. The grass dries up, the flowers loses its color, but the word of God stands forever. I don't know what it feels like is losing in color in your life. I don't know what feels bland. I don't know what feels like it's pointless or like I'm just here paying taxes and going to work. I, I don't know what feels like it's dying in your life. But if I can encourage you, apply the word of God because when you do, it's been tested by all different cultures, by all different nations, by all different people groups, by all sides of the track, by all different ways people talk, by all different occupations, and it still comes true to those who work it. My question to you this morning, what kind of energy do you want to produce? What are you eating? I encourage you, digest this and watch it change your life. Father God, we love you so much. We are so grateful, man, that you love us enough to give us an entire manual on how we can make our life better. Thank you for not 
keeping us to the level of our life that we can produce. But you say you want to tag in and you want to give us an upgrade that we would never be able to receive on our own. God, I pray that you help us all start, create a hunger to, 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 to read the Bible, to, to get to know your word, to get to know your opinions and your thoughts on things and on life and, and, and on how to treat people and on how to love and, and on what we can fix. Help, help us fix our blind spots that we can't even see. And then, God, I pray that you help us apply what we read. Help, help us come to an understanding of what we read, that it's not just this deep theological book, but it's actually my manual for life. And help us see that when we do this, when we apply this book, how it makes our life better in the life of all those around us because you come to enhance and to season our energy and our vibe. Jesus, we love you. We praise you. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. We hope this message encouraged you. For more encouraging messages, check us out at our website, freelifechapel.org. Until then, we hope to see you next time. Have a blessed week.